Our plan is to be able to ship vaccines to the immunization sites within 24 hours from the approval. So I would expect maybe on day two after approval, on the 11th or on the 12th of December, hopefully uh, the first people will be immunized across the United States, across all states. Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Robert Costa, national political reporter at The Post, and today we continue our series, The Path Forward, Combating COVID-19. My guest this morning is Mansov Slawi, the chief scientific advisor for Operation Warp Speed, the Trump administration's team that is developing a strategy and plan for distributing vaccines for the coronavirus. He is a 30-year veteran of vaccine research. Dr. Slawi, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with the news. The head of the FDA, Stephen Hahn, is going to the White House this morning for a meeting. Uh, Axios and others are reporting their tensions between the president, chief of staff Mark Meadows, and the FDA chief. Uh, what do you What do you know about that meeting? Nothing. I just learned about it, frankly, from you, uh, as you stated it here. And you know what? What we have done all the time with huge focus on, and energy is to stay outside of the political arena because what we need is good science and good operations and focus to drive these vaccines home but are there tensions between the white house and the fda at this moment i i don't know i haven't heard of any frankly and i wouldn't think there would be uh, i think the fda is doing a great job you know, looking into the the files that are being reviewed, uh, they, they they were filed a week ago and and yesterday for the two vaccines, and I assume preparing for uh, their public reviews with the Verp Act. Um, we are not as operation, we are not at all involved in that process, so we ha- there is appropriately a firewall and and minimum communication at this stage. That's probably why I'm unaware of of whatever is going on. Well, based on my reporting, there are tensions because people at the White House, including the president, who has publicly said he believes the FDA is slow walking. They want to see a faster approval. Do you believe the FDA should be moving faster at this point? I think the FDA should be doing a thorough job to make sure the review of the vaccine are complete and, uh, you know, in depth and fully scientifically driven, and then have a good uh, discussion and review with their advisory committee, the VERPAC, uh, and uh, and come to the appropriate decision. Uh, I have no reason to believe from all my interactions that they either uh, sped up or uh, slowed down the process. My 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 interactions have always been fully embedded and driven by by science and data, frankly. So. I, I, I have no reason to believe there should be uh, tensions, but there may be. I don't know. You mentioned the separation between Operation Warp Speed and the FDA. Can you just clarify how that works? Where is Warp Speed on this vaccine process and and where is the FDA? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of our audience members may not be totally clear on why there is a distinction. Yes. So Warp Speed actually is, is the operation that integrates the work of the private companies like Moderna and Pfizer, for instance, in this setting, the NIH, one of the HSS agencies, uh, and in particular, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, the NIAID, as it's called, and the Tony, Dr. Tony Fauci and, and, and all his team who, who do a lot of the, the basic work. Uh, the uh, CDC, where we have lots of interaction in regard of the uh, distribution and recommendation on who should be vaccinated, uh, etc., cetera. Uh, and the Department of Defense and its agencies, uh, as they are playing a key role in helping the operation in general operationalize uh, the, all the logistical aspects uh, and also now uh, onto the distribution. The FDA have has always been outside of this integrated coalition uh, that's working actively on the vaccines. Of course, many clinical trial sites, et cetera, are involved. Manufacturing sites are involved. 
So uh, our interactions with the FDA as an operation have been very few. Uh, and from time to time, we sought advice from the FDA on some of our thoughts uh, regarding clinical trial design, for instance, or regarding currently, for instance, whether placebo recipients in the clinical trial should be immunized mm -hmm. with the vaccine and when, and questions like that. And on, on the manufacturing aspects, so what certain requirements, uh, you know, to what extent should there be met uh, for an emergency use authorization as compared to a full VLA? Uh, but I, would, I would say I probably did not have more than 10, at most, 10 meetings, probably seven or eight meetings with the, with the FDA leadership over the whole seven months. At eight, eight when we had AIDS, for instance. You were so. talking about distribution in, in the, the business side of this. Secretary Azar at HHS, he said on Monday that vaccines will be in patients' hands within 24 hours of approval. Can you confirm that timeline? Yes, our plan is indeed to be as soon as approval is granted. Uh, the uh, the shipments of vaccine to start with Pfizer and then later on with Moderna would happen immediately after. Uh, and uh, the vaccine will be shipped to the addresses that each state health agency will have uh, given us and probably many different sites will uh, receive vaccine. Vaccine will be shipped through uh, organizations such as FedEx and UPS that are, of course, used to ship uh, million and hundreds of millions of, of, of parcels uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, upon receipt, they will be ready to be used for immunization. All the ancillary materials, syringes and, uh, you know, alcohol and swabs and all these kind of things are already shipped or being shipped to those locations. So indeed, within 24 hours, maybe at most 36 to 48 hours from uh, uh, the approval, the vaccine can be in people's arms. And, uh, you know, we are conducting trials, uh, uh, really uh, dry runs with exactly the boxes, the dry eyes, the vials, except there is no vaccines in the vials being shipped from the shipping area all the way to uh, about 60 sites across uh, many states in the U.S. today um, uh, as one of the last steps in, in all the purpose and the preparedness to make sure this happens appropriately. Back at the White House, though, they are, they are having this meeting today. Stephen Hahn, Chief of Staff Meadows, President Trump might be involved. And there is upheaval at the White House. And I wonder how this changes your own approach at warp speed, if at all, the resignation on Monday night of Dr. Scott Atlas, who has become a top pandemic advisor for President Trump. So as I said, we worked hard and I, I, I should say succeeded to stay completely out of the politics uh, of this. Uh, our work doesn't depend effectively in terms of our daily decision making or technical and scientific decision making uh, ethical decision making on uh, on White House intervention. We have very, uh, I have personally only met once with Dr. Atlas, for instance, so I have very limited interaction. And uh, uh, so up to now, there hasn't been any, uh, any, any impact or undue influence. This was one of the requirements I had put forward uh, when I was asked to do this role. And I have said publicly many times that the minute I have what I would judge to be undue influence, I would raise my hand and resign. That never happened. In terms of the Moderna and Pfizer announcements, as an expert in the field, what do the details tell you of what they have said in their press releases, in their statements? What is the actual promise and the, re the reality of what's possible from their developments based on your own frank assessment, not being on the corporate side? Yes, so I have seen the data in some detail, particularly the, the, Pfizer, the uh, Moderna data. And I think the data are very clear. Uh, the, the, the power of these data come from the fact that two different vaccines 
developed by two different companies, tested in two different clinical trials, are yielding remarkably similar data. That's really exceptional. The statistics around the 95% protection are very tight, that there is 95% chance that the real efficacy is between 87 or 89% and 97 or 99%. So it's really, really excellently robust data in terms of efficacy. I think the, the fact that there are, for instance, in the Moderna trial, 30 cases of severe disease, all of which are in the placebo. So that's 100% efficacy is also very important and very reassuring. Again, both in the Pfizer and in the Moderna trial, there is between 87 and 94% efficacy against disease in people who are over 65 years of age. These are all exceptionally high numbers and very consistent between the two trials. Also on the safety side of things, the observations are primarily around adverse events that are associated with having received the injection of the vaccine. They mostly last one day to a day and a half. They are mostly pain at the injection site and some redness, as well as a little bit of fever, some chills, uh, some uh, muscle ache, some headache. These happen in a, a noticeable, significantly noticeable way in about 10 to 15 percent of recipients of the vaccine. The majority of recipients of the vaccine have nothing or barely noticeable uh, kind of adverse event. The longer, more important kind of adverse events, such as some autoimmune disease or others, have not been reported uh, in, a, in, a, in a different way between the placebo group and the vaccine groups in these two trials, uh, which is very reassuring. I always make sure I say that while we know that the short term and I'm going to call it midterm uh, safety of this vaccine is now well understood. Uh, the very long term safety is not yet well understood by definition. Uh, but of course, what we are fighting is a pandemic that's killing two or more than 2,000 people every day. Uh, and these vaccines with 95% efficacy are an insurance against that. And uh, it will be very important that the most susceptible parts of our population get these vaccines. And we will be looking at the safety of these vaccines in real life through very elaborate pharmacovigilance processes and report on it on an ongoing basis. That's an important point. Uh, if you see long-term effects, because it's emergency use, it's being rushed out in the coming months, likely. If you see long-term negative effects, could you see some of these vaccines, all of these vaccines pulled in 2021? I really don't think so. Uh, you know, it's, it's always very difficult to project proving the negative. Uh, and, but I would advise that we don't expand in that conversation because today there is absolutely no signal, neither in the biology of these vaccines, the way they work, their mode of action, or in the data generated, uh, and I have in, in, in other instances explained that the FDA has a, a, a very, very large database with hundreds of thousands of people that participated in clinical trials for vaccines over the last four decades that shows that most adverse events, serious adverse events associated with vaccination happen in the 40 days following immunization. That's the reason the FDA required to wait 60 days after immunization before the emergency use authorizations are filed. So all the data we have show that there is no way to predict that there will be something wrong with these vaccines, but we cannot exclude it. Only time will tell. But here I, I'd like to just say, think about what's called the therapeutic index. There is the harm that we know 2,000 people dead every day, 120,000 or more people infected every day, 86,000 or 90,000 hospitalized, and a conceptual, totally unknown, whether it exists or not, risk of a rare adverse event. And the word rare is very important. You know, this, these vaccines have been now studied in between the two of them 
uh, more than 50,000 subjects actually immunized, and there, there are no effects. So we can exclude uh, all uh, somewhat common adverse events. Maybe there could be something that happens one in, in 100,000 people. It's impossible to predict. That's on the adverse events front, but what about on the immediate side effects front? From, from your own study, your own knowledge, what do you know, what can you tell us about the immediate side effects for these vaccines that we've seen in trials? Yes, the immediate side effects, as I said, those are really injection side and some uh, fever. They are totally comparable to many commonly used vaccines, uh, whether in children or in adults or in the elderly. Nothing special, totally similar to other vaccines. How many more vaccines will be needed to vaccinate the world? Very important question. We aim to develop six to eight vaccines. We, are, we have six vaccines in our portfolio here. Four are in phase three. Two will be starting phase three shortly. There are other vaccines developed by U.S. companies that are in phase one and phase two trials. And one of them may be starting phase three trials independently from the operation. And of course, there are other vaccines being developed elsewhere in the world, in Russia or in China or potentially elsewhere. I think for all of us here in the operation, we only have one competitor and one enemy. It's the virus. We are happy to help with all vaccines that are being developed, not directly for all of them. You know, we put all our efforts between six of them. Uh, but any information, any data, any advice that we can give to others, uh, we will we will need a lot of doses of vaccine to immunize the almost 8 billion people on Earth. Uh, I think, just if I judge from the six companies we work with, each one of them has the capacity in its manufacturing capability to probably have between 500 million and a billion doses of vaccine already by the year 2020, by the time year 2021 is completed. That can mean three to six billion doses of vaccine. And that really, I think, is reassuring because uh, between that and the other vaccines being developed, I would hope that by early 2022 or middle 2022, most of the world would have been immunized. What is your confidence in the vaccination development process in Russia and in China? I cannot comment because. I haven't seen it and I have no data. I'm a data driven person, only looking into the science and the you know robust scientific information, which is data. I haven't seen it, therefore I can't comment, but I would only use it, for instance, after data is published and reviewed independently. And what is the global sharing on the vaccines like at this moment? So there is a, a coalition uh, that was driven from the uh, World Health Organization uh, and mostly Europe and the rest of the world, uh, which is called COVAX. Uh, there is another coalition called CEPI, the, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation uh, that's dedicated to uh, foster and enable development of vaccines, primarily for the less developed countries. Uh, they are collaborating. We have calls with them uh, biweekly to share information. A number of the vaccines that we are working on, they also are working on, uh, at least three of them. Uh, uh, so there is a collaboration, but I would say it's not a very tight collaboration, frankly, and this is not necessarily our choice, but that's the reality in which we have been working. Um, personally, I know very well uh, the leader of the COVAX, uh, as he was a CEO of GSK, Formerly, and we, we were the two partners leading the company, uh, primarily around our, our commitment to global health and public health. So we both did something relevant to this uh, pandemic. Uh, and that's, that certainly also allows many informal alignments. You told the New York Times' as Kara Swisher in October that we should be able to immunize 30 to 40 million people by the end of 2020. But with these new developments with Pfizer and Moderna, are we still on track for that number or could that number increase? 
For the end of the year 2020, our projection is to immunize 20 million people. We said we would have 30 to 40 million doses of vaccine, and each individual receives two doses of vaccine. Hence, it's uh, 40 million doses of vaccine, but 20 million people uh, immunized. That's still the number. I think it's very important to say, on the one hand, it's a big number, frankly, from a manufacturing perspective. But unfortunately, on the other hand, it's a small number compared to the U.S. population and the need we have. And therefore, while we are all very excited to have these vaccines coming out, it is going to take a while before the whole population gets immunized, probably between December and June. And therefore, we need to really make sure we don't lower our guard, we continue to wear our mask, wash our hands, keep our distance and keep our awareness that this pandemic is very, very challenging. And uh, hopefully by the middle of the year, I hope most Americans will have been immunized, which means the level of hesitancy that exists currently will have been decreased because people will learn more information, independent information about the vaccine. And if enough people are immunized, we should have this pandemic under control in the second half of 2021. So just to make that point clear, by June of 2021, you believe the whole country can be immunized? Our plans with the six vaccines that we have in our portfolio, or maybe even with only four that, that if they make it by, by that time, we will have produced enough vaccine doses to immunize the U.S. population. Of course, people need to. Vaccines are only useful if they are used and vaccinated. If they stay on the shelf, of course, they are useless. So we, we hear a lot about who goes first. Let me flip that. Who goes last? Who's going to get it in June versus January? Good question. Uh, I think people that are the least at risk. And this is just my personal opinion. As you know, those decisions will be made as recommendations by the CDC and the ACIP, and then effectively operationalized by the states, who will, of course, make their own call, the Department of Health in, in, in every state and jurisdiction. My personal uh, point of view is that we should end with the least impacted populations, which means really pediatric populations young, very young, healthy adults. That's a quite a sizable part of the population. Those, those are the ones where there is the least morbidity and mortality associated with this disease. And conversely, we should start with those who are most exposed and most impacted. It's really the very frail elderly people. More than 50% of deaths are happening, for instance, in long-term care facilities. And the healthcare workers, principally those that are in the front line dealing with COVID patients. The first line workers would come immediately after that. But uh, as I said, in fact, today, the CDC and ACIP are having a first discussions to, uh, to come to a preliminary view as to what, how to prioritize. Uh, the, the other important thing is that the, the number of doses of vaccine is going to ramp up over time. So in, Jan in December, we'll have between 35 and 40 million doses. In January, for those two vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, we will have probably between 60 and 70 million doses if all goes well. And each time, please, we need to divide that number by two to have the number of vaccinees. But then as of February, we hope to add to the 60 to 70 million doses that will come again from the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. We will add probably between 30 and 50 million doses of vaccines coming from the two other programs, the AstraZeneca program and the Johnson & Johnson program. And then that number ramp up even more in the month of uh, March. So very quickly, we'll, uh, we'll start having more than 150 million doses a month uh, in March, April, May. And that's why we'll ramp up quite quickly, uh, I would say, uh, as of March in, in how many people can be immunized. What about those children? You mentioned children who are healthy would, would perhaps be last on that list of priorities if you're beginning with the elderly, the frail, frontline healthcare workers. Suppose in June you get to down that list and you get to healthy children, uh, toddlers or teenagers, and their parents say, 
we're, we don't want them to be vaccinated. Uh, there's conspiracy theories in this country about vaccines. For personal reasons, people say, I don't want my children to be vaccinated. That could happen in some communities. What would that mean to your modeling and the whole country? I think this would have consequences uh, in the sense that one of the objectives of immunizing a large part of the population is to, on the one hand, pre uh, uh, prevent disease and, and death and infections in each individual. So there is an individual insurance. But on the other hand, also create what's called herd immunity that literally stops, aborts the capacity of the virus to continue transmitting in the population. And the virus may, may still be there, but at levels that are so low that even susceptible people that are exposed may not get sick because they get, you know, I'm going to just invent a number. They get 100 virus particles, which doesn't make you sick, versus a billion virus particles, which happens now, and that makes you sick. So there is, I think, a social responsibility here for everybody to really think hard before deciding not to take the vaccine. That look at the reality of what an infectious agent that we cannot even see has done to our population, has killed more than you know, many wars, has stalled our economy, has completely turned upside down the way we live. Vaccines for diseases that already exist, the vaccines that already exist, are how we are able to live a life that until 10 months ago was normal. And vaccines will be what will help us ultimately to control this pandemic. And it's really important that we we, of course, ask questions, listen critically to the information, but listen to the data and, and uh, allow yourself to understand the performance of these vaccines. Because I think if you do so, I feel confident that you will likely agree to take the vaccine for yourself and for those you, you love. I will get the vaccine. I will give it. I have an eight years old kid. I will give him this vaccine. I'll give it to my mother. I'll give it to everybody I love. Have you spoken with President-elect Biden or any of his advisors about these issues? No, I have not. Uh, I have not uh, been contacted, uh, and uh, I have not contacted them. I wouldn't know how to do it. Uh, I learned uh, that I shouldn't do it as long as the transition was not officially happening. Uh, now that the transition is officially happening, I know that there was one meeting uh, late last week just an introductory meeting. I wasn't uh, in that meeting. Um, if I'm contacted, I'll, of course, be happy to share all the information uh, I know. Uh, but up to now, I have not been contacted. What's your big picture piece of advice to the incoming Biden team on the vaccines? My piece of advice is to say, please take the time to see what has been done and understand what has been done in detail before coming to a view on whether to change it or not. Of course, different people and different minds and brains will have different perspective and uh, you know, different ideas are extremely welcome that can enrich and enhance the operation and its performance. Uh, I really hope sincerely uh, that, uh, and, I, and I, it's my expectation, that uh, science and data will continue to drive uh, all decision making because this is what has driven it up to now. So as far as I can project, I think the transition for this operation is going to be or should be a seamless, eventless um, uh, event, uh, because frankly, most decisions are made, the vaccines are being produced, the trials are being completed, we will be distributing, uh, ultimately, each state will make their decision listening to the recommendation from the CDC and ACIP. And uh, we're going to need all the help and the support from the administration, whichever it is, the current one and then the next one, uh, as we are going through this process. And my hope by January 20th, we will have already immunized quite a large number of very uh, fragile uh, and impacted Americans. And hopefully we will already start to see some of the impact of the vaccines. What's your own timeline? How long are you going to stay in this role? Uh, so I, I have said that uh, my 
personal uh, ambition was to make sure I stay in this role until at least two vaccines are approved and in use and two medicines are approved and in use. And the rest of the portfolio is in really is in, in a running state. Uh, so if I look at, at where we are, we have two vaccines that I hope will be approved during the month of December and in use in the month of December. We have two other vaccines that are well into their phase three trials, and we expect that we would be reading out the efficacy of those vaccines in the month of January. Unfortunately, there is so much transmission uh, of this virus currently that that's very likely to happen early in January. And two more vaccines that should be starting phase three within the next few weeks. Uh, we have two medicines approved. We have another life-saving medicine that now has been acquired by a big pharma company that uh, that is going to ensure that it can go even faster than uh, how it was going in the hands of its highly innovative biotech company that came up with it. So I'm almost at the end of adding value full time. Frankly, uh, I am 100% committed to making sure that the operation continues to be successful. But I would think that on the other side of the Christmas break, I can have more of a sporadic from time to time as needed input uh, and support and help. I want to stress that this has nothing to do with the transition. Uh, I said publicly everywhere that I, I, I wasn't aligned with the current administration and much more aligned with the future administration. But the, this role has nothing to do with politics. Uh, and my mission has nothing to do with politics. It was about helping the country and the world. And I think once my added value goes down, it's time for me to move on and, and go back to my public, non-public life, personal life. Well, we'll let you move on with your day, at least this morning. Dr. Mansev Slawi, many thanks for taking the time this morning to walk us through vaccines and to share your perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for joining us back here at Washington Post Live. Make sure to come back here at 11 a.m. My colleague Jonathan Capehart will interview some of the world's uh, best scholars and rising stars on the front lines of what he's calling, and, and the Washington Post is calling, inclusive capitalism. It's a provocative topic. That's today at 11 a.m. with Jonathan Capehart. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching.